Okay, we are um, in uh, Seismic Refraction Lecture 1, and uh, that'll be the third lecture in this class. And we're working off um, the uh, Seismic 1 PDF on uh, page 21. And we're, we had seen in previous lectures, um, uh, I didn't talk about Huygens' principle, um, and I will talk about it later in the reflection part. Um, but in seismic refraction, uh, that's based on Fermat's principle and Snell's law, which I've written here in terms of inverse velocities. So you can see that uh, sine theta 1 goes with the velocity number 1, v1, and sine theta 2 goes with v2 uh, in, an, in this inverse relationship. And uh, just to let you know, uh, if you've forgotten that um, uh, that um, ratio, the sign of the angle of propagation from vertical versus the uh, uh, the, vo the uh, velocity, that ratio stays constant. And uh, it turns out uh, that the ratio is um, equal to a parameter that we can measure right on our seismic recordings. Okay, So that's where we actually get a lot of our data, is uh, by looking at the slope of the, uh, the waves in our um, in our, uh, uh, in our directly in our records, you know, even out in the field, um, we can take a simple display of of our uh, seismic recording and uh, get this uh, dt dx. You know, how uh, how much time does a uh, a particular wave take to travel a certain distance? So um, uh, we're gonna. We, you've seen the uh, concepts of uh, refraction and reflection, and you've seen the concept of the critical uh, refraction, and that occurs uh, in the upper medium um, when uh, the uh, uh, the angle of incidence uh, reaches um, the critical angle, which is theta sub c, and um, and the sine of that critical angle is equal to the ratio of v1 over v2. And this only happens when v1 is less than v2. In other words, when velocity increases with depth. OK, now we're going to apply these concepts um, looking at our, our seismic recordings. And the, uh, the first question I get um, when I show you some seismic recordings is usually, well, how do you tell you know, what's a reflection, what's a refraction, what's an air wave, what's a Rayleigh wave, what's a uh, what's a direct wave? All of those uh, questions. Very good questions. Um, we're gonna, you know, we ask this question: How do we separate these different wave types in our observations, in our seismic records? Okay, I might sometimes call these wave a different wave type, a different phase. Um, you know, like uh, you know, we have seismic energy propagating, and it could change from just like a uh, a solid can change into a liquid phase. Uh, we can have a P wave phase change into a refraction phase. So uh, I'm going to start examining this question and, and hopefully illuminating for you how we decide what kind of wave is what by illustrating what you get in a couple of different simple situations. So on the left are, um, are some model cross sections. And you can tell they're cross sections because we've got x horizontally and z vertically. Okay, and um, on the right is what the seismic recording will look like. I mean, not not really what it'll look like, but if we drew lines along the uh, the arrival times of these different uh, wave types of these different seismic phases, you know, what slope would that would that uh, uh, would that line have? Uh, you know, how how are the uh, seismic arrivals going to line up for the different uh, Different phases. Okay, um, so uh, we'll look at a simple model first, which is uh, a constant velocity model. You know, it's uh, just say solids here in granite. It's got a p velocity of vp, a s velocity of vs. There's some sort of reflector down here, but it doesn't change the velocity, or at least we ignore that. Okay, down here at depth zr. All right. Uh, we also will look uh, in a second at a more complicated model, where we have an interface between two different uh, two different media, and that interface is at a certain depth. Okay, 
and that uh, that interface produces refractions. It produces reflections. Um, it can only, of course, produce a refraction if uh, v1 is less than v2. Okay, so the upper medium has a velocity v1 which is less than the velocity in the lower medium, which is v2. And we're going to be talking about p velocities in this case. Uh, and there's also we can also put a, a this dash reflection which is cut off in the slide uh, down at the uh, down at the bottom, okay, uh, and see where that will come in. All right, so let's look first at the simple situation. All right, so we got a cross section on the left, and on the right we've got a data section, okay. And what are the axes in this? Well, uh, the horizontal axis is the separation, the distance between the uh, the source of seismic energy and the recorder, the geophone. All right. And we'll call that the offset, the source receiver offset. Uh, it's really just a distance horizontally along the ground. Uh, and I'll denote it here by um, capital X, okay, uh, big X. And it's just the, you know, uh, the absolute value of the X location of the geophone, X sub G. And you subtract from that the X location of the source, which is X sub S. And we assume the source is right at the surface as, as your hammer hits will be. Uh, now, so it's it's a very similar axis, right? I mean, over here uh, in the model, we've got x sub s, that's the location of the source, and here's x sub g. So, you know, this uh, the axis on the right-hand side is really just uh, right along the same, the very same axis over here. It's just that the uh, offset starts at the source location. And we're only going to worry you know, here about sources that or geophone locations that are to the right of the source. Okay, so um, but what's uh, 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 what's this vertical axis? Okay, the vertical axis in the section, of course, is depth z. The vertical axis in the uh, in the data section, well, that's time t. You know, how long does the wave take to arrive? All right. So we don't have a depth axis. I mean, this is one of the big um, you know this is a big deal with uh, with uh, seismic uh, uh, seismic recording, whether it's reflection or refraction or even uh, seismic um, uh, uh, surface wave analysis, uh, refraction micro tremor. Um, we record data in time. We record the the waves as they arrive in time, and we have to do some manipulation, some modeling, uh, some calculation to figure out how deep things are. Yeah, that's a big deal. That's why we're that's why we're doing the seismic work is to figure out uh, you know how deep things are, how deep are the reflectors, how deep are the refractors, and to figure out how deep they are, we have to figure out velocities, and thus you know these different velocities that these different waves are appearing at are of great interest to us. Okay, so first uh, um, we're looking at the surface of the Earth here on the left hand side on the on the uh, uh, on the cross section and the sources at the surface, the receivers at the surface. So there's a wave that propagates from the hammer hit through the air, okay, to the receiver, whatever distance that receiver is. Here we got, we got one particular example of an X sub G, and that that air wave is propagating just right at the, uh, you know, right above the surface, okay. So we have uh, you know the surface of the Earth here air above and rock down below, or soil, if you'd rather call it soil. All right, well, um, air has a really constant velocity, especially in, uh, in one experiment, at least on the scale that we, that we do our uh, seismic experiments. So that velocity, uh, if you don't remember from the velocity table, it's right about 330 meters per second. Okay, so we'll find that air wave here. Uh, and 330 meters per second, if you remember the velocity tables up above in the notes here, uh, is pretty slow. So the air wave uh, is going to take more time than uh, most all the other waves um, to get to, from the uh, source to the receiver. So that gives it in the data section, that in, and I'll start calling it a time section, or really what this is is a time distance plot, right? Offset versus time. The air wave is one of the steepest. Why? Because being steep, you know, to go a short distance, it takes a lot of time. All right, uh, and it's not always true in the uh, 
with the experiments we'll do that the air wave will be the slowest wave, but uh, um, let's assume that it is, and that's, uh, that's a pretty typical situation. All right, so the air wave uh, is this steep line here, and it's a straight line because the velocity is constant, uh, and it's just propagating, you know, we just, uh, it, it propagates according to the distance from the, um, of the receiver from the source, of the geophone from the source. So, you know, as you step out to larger distances, it's proportionately larger, thus a straight line, okay? Uh, now, let's, uh, let's see what else is coming in, okay, from this source to this receiver. There's a lot of different waves arriving, okay? The air wave is just the slowest one, usually. Um, there's also a direct P wave, propagates, you know, really straight from the, from the source uh, to the receiver, but in the ground, okay? Not in the air, but in the ground. And so uh, that propagates, of course, at the P velocity. And I said this section has a constant velocity, okay, at least in the rock, uh, constant VP, constant VS, constant uh, air, air velocity, right? And the P wave velocity is faster than the S wave velocity. So really the P, the, the, the P arrival, the compressional wave, should be the first to arrive. So it's going to have this shallowest slope, all right? And the time is equal to the distance divided by the P wave velocity, right? So, and that, that describes a constant slope, you know, and the, and the, you know, technically the slope of this, uh, of this line, uh, which I haven't drawn exactly straight, but should be exactly straight, the slope of the line is uh, the inverse of the velocity VP. So all we have to do is just observe this, uh, this arrival VP, it's going to be the first one to arrive, so it should be easy to see. Okay, uh, if we don't see it, that means that our experiment isn't working very well. Uh, we're not putting enough energy in, or the noise is too too much. All right, and once we see it, okay, we just draw a straight line through it, and we make sure that line goes right back to right zero time at zero distance. Right, it's got to go back to the origin to um, uh, to appear. Um, Right, because it, it's not going to, you know, if we put the uh, the receiver right on top of the source, right, it's going to get there at exactly the time that we hit the the plate with the uh, the hammer, uh, or hit the ground with the hammer, and um, that time, you know, is zero time on this scale. You know, it's it'll have some some absolute time and date and all that, but uh, all of these uh, time distance plots and the records that we'll look at, you know, the time starts. At that at that time when the plate hits the hammer, how do we get that time? Well, I'll, I'll show you in the field. I'll show you as we're uh, training you to take these seismic surveys. Um, we have a, a little sensor that uh, rides on the hammer handle, and and uh, you know within the um, you know a few microseconds of the uh, of the plate hitting the hammer, it'll notify the the seismograph that that's the zero time, the time it sets to zero. And that's actually when the seismograph starts to record. Okay, so um, we have the slowest wave, the air wave with a steep slope here, the fastest wave, the P wave with this uh, shallow, shallowest slope uh, right here. Okay, there's other ones. Remember, uh, the S wave velocity is about half, maybe two thirds, as much as two thirds of the uh, P wave velocity. So the S wave velocity is, is slower. It's still a straight line, it's still constant. Okay, and um, so it's going to be in between here, right? Uh, takes twice as much time, or or more than twice as much time, but about twice as much time for the uh, S wave to arrive as the P wave. So I've almost drawn it right here, and then the uh, Rayleigh wave. If you remember uh, uh, Rayleigh waves, um, that's this other dashed line here, which is uh, the Rayleigh wave velocity is uh, ninety percent of the S wave velocity. And so this slope is just a little bit steeper than the, the VS slope. Okay, we can measure if we can see those slopes, then we can measure those wave velocities too. And in fact, in a couple of lectures from now, we'll actually start measuring those those velocities. Okay, now so we have uh, P waves, S waves, Rayleigh waves. They're all propagating right along the surface from the the source to the receiver. Okay. Now, of course, what we want to do is we want to probe below the surface. Uh, we could be interested in, in the velocity right at the right to, at the surface, and there's uh, you know this kind of survey is very good at getting that. But maybe we want to get some other um, you know we want to see some structure and we want to get 
the depth to that structure. Okay, so here we have a flat reflector at depth z sub r, the depth of the reflector, and so a wave comes down from the source, bounces off at the same angle, comes back up to the to the geophone. Okay, so if you uh, if you think about it, uh, you know when you get when the geophone is very very far away compared to the depth to the reflector, you know the this this triangle is really open very wide and and the legs of it are almost horizontal. All right. So at very great distances, the um, the time of the uh, of the reflection uh, approaches. Okay, it's a little bit more, but approaches the time of the P wave. Okay, if we're talking about a P wave reflection, which we are. Um, but uh, there's also a minimum time that it takes. Right, uh, even if you put the source right on top of the receiver. Okay. Uh, it's still the wave still has to go down, bounce off, and come back up. So there's a minimum time. <coughs> so uh, that's actually uh, if you work it out, uh, you can just take the uh, the you know make a, an equation for the uh, length of this uh, the two sides of this triangle here, and that's what this equation is here. It's uh, the the travel time squared is equal to four times. The depth of the reflector squared divided by the p velocity squared plus the offset capital X squared divided by the p velocity squared again. All right, so um, that's actually the equation of a hyperbola in this uh, in this record, and so the hyperbola will have a top uh, that's at zero um, zero offset. Okay, and it, it'll you know if you if you allowed negative offsets then. It would curve off in the other other uh, direction uh, down to the left. So at zero offset, it has the minimum time. That makes sense. You know, you put both the source and receiver right above the reflector, and that's going to be the minimum time. Uh, the other thing, being a hyperbola, you know, what is the slope of this line? Well, it's actually uh, it's actually flat, right at zero offset. It's perfectly flat, right at zero offset in this ideal situation. So that means that that the apparent velocity, the velocity that we think we're seeing, is infinite. So of course this is a, you know, this doesn't represent the actual rock velocity. I mean, v air represents the air velocity. The shear wave uh, velocity uh, on this straight line represents the true shear wave velocity of this constant velocity model. Okay. The uh, the p wave slope, you know, represents the true p velocity. But this um, this you know, infinite velocity. Of course, it can't represent the true p velocity, right? Even though it's a p wave reflection. Okay. Uh, what we look at though is that all right. We if we can figure out you know what slope this hyperbola is asymptotic to, all right, that'll give us the p wave velocity. Okay. And that that minimum time, right? If if we go to the equation here, if you can see it, um, t squared is four z r squared over v p squared plus another term. Which is x squared over vp squared. All right. If we take um, if we take uh, x squared to be zero, okay, uh, then the second term goes away. And if we have this time, then we can convert it directly to uh, uh, you know we take uh, half the time and we divide by the uh, p wave velocity and we get the depth. Okay. So there's our first you know very first way of getting uh, getting depth. All right. So that's the uh, the simple, uh, the simple situation and the analysis you can do there, and and some clue I hope you know. How do we separate? How do we know what's what's what in our seismic records? What kind of wave is it? I ask you that question a lot in the in the labs. Well, the answer is in you know first okay, what's the slope of the wave? You know what's its uh, what's its uh, uh, distance versus time, right? And that gives you the velocity. And then look, you know, by comparing the different slopes, the different velocities in the in the section, you can usually figure out you know what kind of wave you're looking at. All right, so let's introduce some additional complication, uh, and that's this layer over half space. All right, so the layer is constant velocity, the half space is constant velocity. We're just going to look at at p waves really, and the um, you know in the layer above it's uh, p velocity v1, and the layer below it's p velocity v2. <clears throat> and that um, uh, that's also constant in the layer below. All right, we still get the the direct wave, right? So there's uh, uh, and now I've made the slope a little bit uh, uh, steeper, but that's the same v1. Okay, 
And um, there's still a Rayleigh wave, uh, which I've drawn as this dashed line. There's still an air wave. I put that in there, right? So it's kind of lo we're looking kind of at an expanded plot now, okay? And there's a very important phase here, okay? Uh, we're going to see why exactly, but there's a wave that comes down, converts to a refraction, runs at the, it's at the critical angle, and it runs right along, you know, just in, just underneath the uh, the interface between v1 and v2. So being just underneath, it's it's propagating at this faster velocity v2, and that starts about here, and, uh, and then it comes back up. So it has a minimum time, right? You put uh, the source and receiver together, and you're you're going to observe that minimum time. So it connects to the reflection. Here's the reflection that's asymptotic to v1. Okay, you can see that. That's the upper reflection from the upper interface. There's a lower interface too. We're not going to deal with that right now. <clears throat> and the um, uh, the reflection, uh, well, the the refraction has this minimum time right along the reflection. Okay. But the refraction doesn't really develop until you separate these two legs that are both at uh, um, that are both at the critical angle. All right, and so there's some minimum distance to get a refraction a refracted wave. And that's called the critical distance. Very hard to observe, but uh, easy to calculate. So write that dot that dot right there. You'll start get, getting this straight line. Then the straight line, you know, as you keep uh, increasing the distance between the source and the receiver, you're you're not going to change these the lengths of these uh, these legs of the refraction, which are the middle ones. The legs of the refraction, um, you're um, you're going to take change to the length of time it spends in the v2 medium, in the lower medium, okay, in the half space, right under the interface, which we'll start calling a refractor too, okay. And so that's another straight line, but it's at v2. Now v2 has to be greater. We don't get a refraction unless v2 is greater than v1, right? So eventually it's at a shallower slope, and it outruns, crosses over the v1 line, the direct P wave, and becomes the first arrival, the first thing that you see. You know, if you're out here at further distance, you see noise, 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 and then finally at the this v2 time, you see a um, you see a wave coming in, okay, and um, and that's the uh, the refraction, okay, and then the uh, the other uh, reflection down below is going to be asymptotic to that, okay. So let's uh, let's apply that now, okay. We're we'll going to page twenty two of the of the notes, uh, which has a nine at the top right. Don't ask me why. Um, so we're going to uh, start looking at the size and refraction technique. Uh, in, at the end of the last notes, I said uh, reflection by mistake, and it's the most fundamental technique. What it gives us is a direct estimation of rock velocities, okay? Usually p velocities, and um, it's also very good at uh, coming up with very accurate velocities that are averaged over, you know, the uh, some distance, you know, like the distance between the sources and receivers. So, you know, averaged over the the length of the cable you use to connect the uh, the the receivers uh, uh, all together. Okay, so uh, uh, okay, what can you do with uh, um, with rock uh, uh, with rock velocities? Okay, um, you can do a little bit of geological work. Okay, you can you can you can use um, the si the seismic refraction technique and analysis. Uh, survey and analysis techniques in two modes. You can use it for sounding, and you can use it for profiling. Okay, when you're sounding, you're you're kind of trying to stand in one place and look down and just look for depths to refractors. Okay, uh, and and of course a refractor is any place where there's a sharp increase in velocity with depth. All right, um, and you can also use it for profiling. All right. You look for uh, uh, changes in depth. You know, maybe the refractors are dipping. Okay, so they'll change. Um, the refractors will change depth depending on where you are above them. You know, where you what what's your x location? Okay, you can also look for changes in velocity. You know, there's a lot of things that uh, you know, such as uh, hot springs, uh, geothermal resources, faulting, fracturing, uh, that uh, soil development that will uh, 
change velocities uh, with respect to uh, where you are. Okay, so you can see that you know seismic refraction gets you the ratio between depth and velocity, you know above uh, and talking about velocity above refractors. Okay, and you can usually uh, define this in terms of the topography of the of the refractor. Okay. And it's uh, most accurate for locating strong refractors, such as the bottom of the unsaturated zone, or let's say the water table, the floor of the basin, buried volcanics, or or just the simple, uh, you know, rock, uh, um, you know, hard rock, where uh, you'd have to start blasting if you're excavating instead of uh, uh, just removing it with a dozer, right? So uh, seismic refraction surveys are very very popular for. Um, uh, for ripability tests and and uh, foundation work, where you're trying to locate, uh, all right, how deep is the hard rock at this site, and does the depth to hard rock change over the site? Uh, you can't design your foundation until you have uh, uh, the answers to those questions. Okay, um, you know, if the depth to hard rock is uh, is really great, then uh, if it's a big enough building, you're going to have to build a uh, you're going to have to build a foundation on piles. Um, and if uh, you're trying to do an excavation and you have a, a certain depth that you say for a pipeline that you need to excavate to, and you find that there's really hard rock uh, that's not very rippable, or it would take you know such an expensive uh, and large bulldozer to rip it that uh, becomes impractical, right? You want to know where that hard rock appears before you start ripping, right? Um, because uh, you know, having to go back and, and rent a larger dozer, that's uh, that's pretty expensive. You know, all the work stops until you're until you can get that larger dozer in there. So um, these seismic refraction surveys are very very popular for that kind of work. Okay, so here's our simplified time distance plot for a layer over a half space. All right, time increases down. Okay, forgot to say that uh, when we were looking at the general diagrams. Okay, so when you're right on top of the, uh, and, and this is the still the x-axis, it's the uh, the distance uh, axis. Okay, and um, when you're right on top of the source, okay, you see it go off at zero time. Okay, so it's zero distance, zero time, zero zero. All right, and uh, the the first arrival is the uh, P wave, the direct P wave for a while. And then after some some distance, after the crossover distance, uh, the refraction beats it out and, and comes out ahead of it, and becomes the first arrival. the uh, the p The p wave is uh, is traveling. The direct p wave is traveling at at velocity v one, and uh, you know if we just have a simple layer over half space, so the refractor the interface is uh, flat, then uh, the velocity below the uh, the uh, interface, uh, the velocity of the refractor, is going to be uh, uh, exactly the same as the the slope of this uh, dx dt of uh, this first arrival at larger distance. So that's the key. You identify when you have a refraction when you have two slopes, okay, and you have a, a slope, you know, from the from the the source. Uh, location you have a slope at a smaller velocity v1, and then it's overtaken after a crossover distance by a larger velocity v2. Okay, you just observe that change in slopes from low slope from low velocity to high velocity. That's all you need to know. Uh, that identifies pretty certainly that you have a uh, a refractor. Okay, that you you can do refraction analysis. What are some of the things we measure? We 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 try to measure the crossover distance, which is as you can see here. It's often in between our, our receivers. You know, we're we're just connecting the, the dots, right? So we have uh, maybe twelve or twenty four receivers here. Um, you know, usually no more than forty eight, and so they got some distance between them uh, between the geophones, and our crossover distance, you know, usually is going to occur right between some. Right between a couple of the uh, receivers, uh, if we take the refraction line and project it back to the zero distance axis, to the time axis, okay, then you know even though the refraction doesn't exist at zero distance, we still mark that time. We call that an intercept time, where it's the intercept of the refraction 
slope with the, uh, the time axis. And that's called uh, t sub i, intercept time. All right. Uh, so we can we can we and we can't usually see the the critical distance x sub c can't usually see it. We can guess the crossover distance usually right right with the data. We can uh, you know slap some rulers down on our on our um, on our record and we can uh, uh, or you know put our t arrival times and distances into Excel and we can get um, the uh, uh, the 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 v one. Uh, the dx over t, dt for v1, we get v2, we get the uh, intercept time, right? We just extend it back to the uh, the axis. That's the that's what we measure, okay, in refraction work. So here's the the cross section that corresponds to this, and uh, I hope to uh, make it clear. Here's the source at uh, at uh, uh, zero distance, okay, x equals zero. Now this uh, vertical axis is uh, uh, Z depth for a cross section. Z1 is the depth of the refractor. The refractor is flat. We get velocity V1 above, V2 below. Okay, and uh, if it comes, if the uh, wave goes down from the source at theta sub c, which is the critical angle, okay, and comes straight back up, you know, just like a reflection right there. All right, that distance, you know, from the source to the Geophone is going to be x sub c, the cr the critical distance. All right, and after it's propagated a while in the faster uh, rock down below the the refractor, it'll come back up again at the same angle, at the same critical angle, and it will make this and and we'll see it come in at the crossover distance, you know, where it just starts to overtake the direct P wave, you know, which is right here. Okay. Uh, this requires, uh, as as I've said before, v1 to be less than v2. All right, and the critical angle here, as we uh, looked at before when we talked about, uh, you know, we're we're bending from the uh, critical angle to 90 degrees. Right. This is this refraction here, this uh, refracted leg of the uh, of the propagation uh, ray path, is at 90 degrees from the the normal to the 90 degrees from vertical. And 90 degrees from the normal to the uh, um, to the refractor, right? They're the same. That's the same thing. Okay. The critical angle is uh, uh, the inverse sine of v1 over v2. Okay. So if we know the velocities, we can calculate the critical angle. All right. So v1 is the velocity of the surface layer. We got that from the uh, the pick set distances less than the crossover distance. Uh, we get its slope. We draw it to always zero, zero, zero distance, zero time. V two, okay, is the velocity of the refractor, okay, and that is at distances x greater than the crossover distance. All right. So um, now we start to uh, uh, do a little math to uh, put put these these things together. You know, what would the critical distance be? Okay, x sub c is equal to two times z1, that's the depth of the refractor, divided by the square root of the quantity uh, v2 or v1 squared minus 1. Okay, um, So that, that's useful in uh, some further math, but we can't really observe it. Okay, um, The intercept time, though, is uh, you know the, that line extended to the time axis from the v2 picks. All right? That's actually, uh, uh, you know, we, we can derive an equation from that. And that gives us the uh, the ability to get the uh, the depth. So the equation for the intercept time is two times the depth z1 uh, times uh, the ratio of the square root of v2 squared minus v1 squared divided by v2 and divided by v1. Okay. Uh, likewise, we can we can get an equation for the crossover distance, and these are these are actually derived in your uh, in your text, which I recognize it's not a it's not a good textbook. It's a it's much more a reference book, okay, uh, and so it has the derivations. So the crossover distance is two times uh, uh, z one again, but uh, it's the the square root of the quantity uh, of the ratio v two plus v one divided by v two minus v one. All right, and uh, that will. Uh, um, that will give you the uh, 
uh, the, the, the crossover distance. Okay. Um, so um, now, so that's, you see we have two equations here uh, that both can get, we could solve either one, either the intercept time equation or the crossover distance time uh, equation. We could solve either one to uh, uh, to get the uh, um, uh, to get the uh, to get the depth to the refractor. All right, if that's what we want it wanted to do. All right, so we could we can compute it from the intercept time. All right, z one is equal to t i over two. Uh, times v2 v1 divided by the square root of, of the quantity v2 squared minus v1 squared, or we can calculate it from the crossover distance. You know very equivalently. So z1 is also equal to x the crossover distance x cross divided by two times the square root of the ratio v2 minus v1 over v2 plus v1. All right. Um, now, what do you do when you got two different methods? Uh, you know, what's the the best engineering practice uh, when you got two different methods of calculating the same thing? Well, it's best to try to observe them both and see if you can get the same result from both of them. If you don't get the same result from both of them, that tells you that whatever assumptions you have behind your uh, uh, behind your your equations, you know, something's gone wrong. Okay, maybe you need to do some more work. All right. Uh, one of the important equations, some of the important equations that are behind the, uh, um, uh, or some of the important assumptions that are behind the equations we've just been looking at, are the flat reflector, refractor, okay, the flat structure, that's a huge assumption, and also uh, another one that uh, uh, will come into play is that we have constant velocity in uh, a v1 in the upper layer, okay. Uh, if the velocity is not constant in the lower layer, you know, uh, below the refractor, uh, that also has a, an influence, but not as prominent as uh, if the velocity is not constant above the refractor. Okay, so uh, you know this is a good test to see whether the analysis method you've used is is uh, uh, is going to work. You know, what's the accuracy of your of your um, of your result? And I guarantee you that even you know. For a real field survey, even where you do have a perfectly flat reflector and perfectly constant velocities in the uh, in the uh, above the refractor, they're still not going to come out exactly the same. Okay, and so it's a good way of uh, you know even in that very simple and direct situation, it's a good way of getting a a measure of your experimental uncertainty, which is something you should always do. All right, just good engineering practice, good scientific practice. Okay, now you might be asking, all right, what if I got more than one refractor, right? I mean, here in the Great Basin, you know, we'll see the first refractor often at the water table, and then we'll get another one at the top of the volcanics, and maybe even another one, uh, a, a third refractor at the uh, at the at the bottom of the basin, at the top of the, you know, uh, um, of the granite or the uh, Paleozoic uh, roof pendants. So. So uh, and and we can still maintain this system where you know as we go down velocity always increases right v1 is less than v2 is less than v3 is less than v4 if we had that and we have a thickness h1 of the upper layer which is uh, um, equal to the uh, uh, the depth z1 and then to get to z2 we go through h2 and so forth all right. Okay, how do we identify when we have more than one refractor? All right, well, we we have more than one slope in our in our data. Okay, and um, it's uh, uh, very easy to see that uh, often. Um, you know, you can see uh, v1 close to the source, and you get to the first crossover distance, uh, which I've denoted here by x sub cr1. And you get to a, a higher velocity, and then you get to the second crossover distance, which I've denoted here by x sub cr two, and you get to the even higher velocity. And each of those, you know, the v one line has an intercept t i one. The v three line has an intercept t i two. Okay. Uh, now, often, um, at least in the Great Basin, we'll see that this intermediate velocity v two it's shown by the fewest receivers. Okay. And um, 
and, and so it may be the most uncertain of the velocities we have. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there's plenty of times when we only see v1 from the very closest uh, uh, geophone. Okay? We don't see v1 very long at all. It's only observed by one, you know, one geophone. We draw that line just from the origin, 0, 0 point, to, uh, uh, to the first geophone. And then from there, it's v2, and then after that, v3. Okay? So uh, we draw from to the closest geophone. That gives us a max. It turns out that gives us a maximum v1, right? If uh, if our geophones are are too far away from the source to really nail down v1, right? To have at least three geophones that see that v1, then it turns out that the uh, v1 will get to one geophone is a maximum. It's an estimate of the maximum possible v1. Okay. Now uh, z1, it, we just treat it like a you know, uh, we have the first crossover distance. We have ti one, okay. So we can get z one the same way, okay. Uh, then we want z two. Well, z two is equal to z one plus h two. So here's an equation for h two, okay. And uh, h two involves um, uh, ti two, right? The larger ti two is, the larger h two is going to be, and the larger z two is going to be. But um, we have uh, uh, Ti2 minus 2z1 times the square root of v3 squared minus v1 squared divided by v3 divided by v1. And then we got to scale all that by uh, this ratio, v3 times v2 divided by 2 divided by the square root of uh, v3 squared minus v2 squared, right? A lot of numbers in there, three velocities, okay? Um, one, uh, uh, one depth, one intercept time, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, you know, the more there's more computation, um, there, and that results in more uncertainty. So H two can be really, you know, a lot more uncertain than Z one was, right? Z two is going to be a lot more uncertain than uh, a lot less certain than Z one, uh, because there's all this computation, all these estimates that go into it, right? Every one of these things is measured. You know, Z one was computed, T T I two is measured, V one, V two, V three, they're all. They're all uh, measured, so uh, you know every every single thing that goes in there has an uncertainty, and it all plays into even greater uncertainty. Now you can go to uh, multiple flat layers, and and we have computer programs around that will uh, give you the travel time for a wave that's critically refracted refracted at the n minus one interface. And so here's an equation for that. I'm not going to bother with that because when we get to multiple layers, you know we're really talking about dipping uh, refractions. So let me let me talk for a bit about uh, dipping refractors. Okay, um, as soon as we have a dipping refractor, as soon as we have structure, as soon as we have dip, okay, uh, instead of those slopes, you know, the v1 and v2 slopes that fit the first arrival picks, they're not true velocities. They're not rock velocities. They are apparent velocities. They're like that reflection. You know, they depend on the geometry of things more than they depend. On the true rock velocities, so the apparent velocities depend on the true velocity. Yes, that's that's correct, but also they depend on the dip. Okay, and that's the that's the crucial uh, the crucial problem. All right, so you have. Um, I'm going to make sure you can see this uh, uh, well enough. Okay, the um, uh, here's a uh, cross section on the left. And a uh, and a data section on the right, okay, and we still have the source on the left, you know, both on the cross section and uh, in the time distance plot, the time section on the right, okay. That's where the source is. Um, now, really, there's two models shown in this uh, uh, in this cross section on the left, uh, uh, and just for reference, here's the the horizontal refractor, okay. So uh, let's say uh, uh, the source is on the down dip side, right? So the dip is uh, is to the left, okay? Down dip to the left, and it's we're going to propagate waves up dip. That's why I've got this labeled up dip because I'm I'm good, I'm I'm thinking about the way that the waves are propagating. Are the waves propagating up dip, or you know when we're dipping away from the source, are the waves propagating down dip? Now notice that the critical angle here is rotated by the dip because the the normal to the um, the normal to the 
um, to the uh, uh, the straight the planar reflector, you know that is uh, rotated. That goes with the dip. It's rotated by the dip. Okay, so we got a dip beta. All right, and if we're shooting up dip, okay, the source is on the down dip side. The receiver is on the up dip side. Okay, then uh, all right, what happens? All right, v1 is the same line. All right. The, the horizontal propagation that's not affected by the dip. Okay, um, you know we don't see that that refractor. Okay, so v1 is the same line. All right, uh, if we're shooting up dip, then the apparent velocity is going to be greater than the true v2. Right in this cross section, you know down below the the refractor we have a second velocity, a higher velocity. All right, if it was horizontal, right our our, um, we'd be along this dashed line, and the, the arrival, you know, there would be the crossover, and the arrival would have this slope v2. But uh, you know, if we're shooting up dip, then uh, it arrives sooner, right? That makes sense. This is, you know, the ref the fast refractor is is carrying the wave, you know, closer to the closer to the receiver, so it ought to arrive sooner. Okay, and the steeper the dip, uh, and we're shooting up dip, you know, the the flatter this v2 line is going to get, okay, but it's at some apparent velocity, which is flatter than the true, higher than the true velocity. Okay, likewise, if we're shooting down dip, then it's going to get there later, right? The the refractor is carrying the the refraction uh, away from the the receiver, okay. So we're going to shooting down dip. It's going to come in later, and the apparent velocity is going to be less, smaller than. The, the velocity we observe and pick is going to be less than v2. Okay, and here's some equations for the apparent velocity, and you can see that the apparent velocity is, uh, you know, basically uh, uh, v1 uh, over the uh, the sine of uh, of the critical angle, except we got to adjust the critical angle by the amount it gets rotated by the dip, right? So if we're shooting up dip, the um, uh, it's uh, the apparent velocity is v1 over the sine of uh, theta c uh, minus beta, okay, and so uh, uh, you know the sine is going to be smaller than it should be, and uh, and that's going to make since the sine is on the on the denominator, that's going to make uh, v1 um, v, the apparent velocity greater than v2, okay. Shooting down dip, the apparent velocity is um, Divided by the sine of uh, the critical angle plus the dip, okay, beta, and um, so uh, the sine is going to be larger, which means it's going to, you know, relative to what it should be, it's going to make the apparent velocity less than v two. Okay. Now those equations rely on having an accurate estimate of the refractor's velocity. All right. What do we do? Okay. If we don't, if, if we just do this one experiment and we don't know whether the refractor is dipping, okay, so we go to a new area, you know, and, and we it just it looks perfectly like a flat refractor, refractor, right? We get a velocity, and we say, oh well, that's v two, uh, wrong, okay. You've always got to check for dip, okay. You have to do another experiment. You got to put the source in a different place and do it again, record another record, okay. To make sure you don't have dip, okay. The quickest solution, uh, you know, the right solution is actually uh, what size opta two D does. Uh, you lay out uh, uh, your your geophone line, and you actually put uh, at least seven, uh, hopefully more than nine different sources, you know, on each end and at the quarter points and away from the, uh, uh, you know, out away from the uh, um, the line, you know, in all all in line. Um, you know that's that's the way to really nail everything down. Uh, but the minimum you have to do, you just you do not have a refraction survey unless you at least have a reversal. Okay, so you lay out your refraction line. You've got your geophones in here. Okay, this is a cross section here that we're looking at, and there's a dip in there. Okay, a dip of beta, right? And uh, but there is a higher velocity down there, right? So you're going to get a refraction. And you get one, you know, shooting up dip, and then you 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 keep recording, you know, you 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 um, you know keep the the receivers in the same place, 
and you bring the the shot around to the other side, okay, the and and you reverse it. You shoot down dip, and and, and until you do the shooting, you don't know which way is up and which way is down dip. But um, you know this allows you to figure it out. That means we get two time distance plots, which is kind of badly drawn here, and you're going to draw it better in lab on um, uh, you know uh, on graph paper or on uh, um, on the uh, um, uh, in Excel, okay, and uh, so what we've got is here's zero zero for the original shot, and then at the maximum distance, you know, the furthest point you had any geophone from that shot, you put the reverse shot, okay. So now that's at x max, and of course zero time, all right. So you know uh, the and, and this original shot, we'll call it the forward shot. All right, so it has same v1. All right, and here is the v2, the the apparent loss we get shooting forward, and then with the reverse shot, there's v1, same v1. Okay, and it's just dashed now, and there's the reverse shot, which you see is coming in way earlier. Okay, there's the reverse shot um, for uh, uh, that's and, and it's giving a uh, a very different uh, uh, velocity. It's giving a. Uh, it's giving a. Uh, it's not only way earlier. It's 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 way steeper. So it's 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 a lower velocity. So these velocities can differ by a lot, even though they're coming off the same refractor in the same places. So in lab, we're going to look at some seismic records from a refraction line, and we're going to look at various shots into those. Uh, uh, geophones in that line, uh, particularly the uh, forward shot and the reverse shot, and we're going to analyze it with the equations that we've uh, been looking at, and figure out how to uh, decide where the uh, whether the dip is uh, in one way or the other, and how much dip there is, and then what the velocities really are. So we're going to uh, pick the first arrivals, and we're going to see the uh, v1 and uh, v2 forward and v1 and v2 reverse. Um, we're going to be able to place them onto a plot like this. And um, one of the things that uh, will come into this is uh, the fact that uh, when you put a, uh, a shot, say, here on the left-hand side and a receiver on the right-hand side, okay, uh, you record a certain arrival, a P-wave refracted arrival, at a certain time. And that time uh, on this diagram would be right here. Then when you put a shot where the re receiver was, where the geophone was, and you put a recorder, a geophone where the shot was, okay, so you've effectively reversed it, right? So you have the same path, you just go from left to right instead of right to left. So the time should be the same. That's called the principle of seismic reciprocity. Okay, and so the this time that should be the same we call the reciprocal time t sub r, all right. So that t sub r should be essentially the the other side, the long distance intercept, you know, at the other side source, uh, the time axis on the other side under the other side source. Okay, so this is the reciprocal time for the reversal at the longest distance, and we come down here. Here's the re reciprocal time. For the forward shot, um, that's come, you know, essentially the same distance, same path, just backwards, okay, uh, right to left instead of left to right. It uh, actually should make no difference. Uh, the seismic energy will follow exactly the same path, and uh, you know, the whether the energy is going east to west or, or west to east shouldn't make any difference in the velocity or the time, okay. So. We have to be careful that when we finally draw these lines, we keep the same reciprocal time. And I'll instruct you about that in lab, too. So uh, the reciprocal time is uh, one very good constraint on this. I mean, we're not saying what time it is. It just has to be the same time for both the forward and the reverse. And there's an apparent velocity from the forward and apparent velocity from the, the reverse for the refraction. Uh, and so here, in this example, the forward shot, the shot itself is down dip, and it shoots up dip. So 
V2F you know, comes out as a greater, a higher apparent velocity than V2R, which is lower. All right, so here we have V2F being greater than V2R. And uh, what also happens is that uh, uh, the intercept times are, are also uh, uh, different, right? If it, was, if it wasn't dipping, they'd be the same, okay? Just like the reciprocal times, but with dip, they're not, they're not the same. So TIF is greater than TIR, okay? And I think you can see that's the way I've drawn it too. So now we assign the uh, the larger of uh, v two uh, f or v two r, you know, whichever way it actually goes, right? You you don't follow what I did here unless uh, it's the same situation. So if it's reversed, you use the other uh, the other way. So um, uh, we uh, we we find the maximum velocity and the maximum of those apparent velocities, those v two apparent velocities become v two max, and then the other one is v two min. Okay, and we also have uh, reciprocal time. We have uh, intercept times, maximum and minimum. Okay, reciprocal times the same, just like I explained. So as uh, as the diagram up here, okay, so where we have uh, v two f uh, greater than v two r, then v two max is um, is v two f, and v two min is v two r. Ti max is Tif, Ti min is Tir. Uh, on the other hand, if the dip is the other direction, right, then we would have V2F less than V2R, and uh, V2 max would be equal to V2R, V2 min would be equal to V2F, Ti max is equal to Tir, Ti min, which you can barely see on the notes here, is equal to Tif. So now here's the equations for computing, you know, with a dipping refractor and a reversed experiment. Um, the refraction velocity, the depth, and the dip. So the first thing you actually do is you get the critical angle, uh, essentially by averaging the uh, the angles from the uh, the critical angles from the two um, from the two experiments. Uh, now, one thing you that's that's not stated here that you will find in lab is that um, you may not get exactly the same v one. Okay, and that happens all the time. Uh, you know the Earth is more complicated than our very simple models and equations here, so we have to make them the same. Um, so we have to use uh, some v1 uh, that uh, can represent both. So often we just use the average. Um, you know we, we measure a v1r and a v1f and we average them and we get a v1. Okay, so first we uh, we get v1 and then um, v1 over v2 max. We take that ratio, we take its inverse sine, and we add it to the inverse sine of v1 over v2 min. Okay, and uh, add those together. Uh, take the those those are two angles now. Uh, take half that now is the uh, the critical the critical angle. Now, since uh, the uh, sine of the critical angle is v1 over v2, right? So then we have uh, we can get v2 now. Uh, we've already got v1. Now we get the second velocity. That's half of what we need to know, um, really. It's and and of course v2 is just v1 divided by sine uh, of the sine of the critical angle, sine of theta sub c. Uh, then we can go ahead with these uh, further equations, and we can get the dip beta here, which is uh, another averaging process. The inverse sine of v1 over v2 min minus now taking the difference. The uh, inverse sine of v1 over v2 max, and take half of that difference, and that turns out to be the dip beta. Uh, the depths we can calculate uh, uh, at the uh, at the low side of the dip or at the high side of the dip, right? So z max and z z min, and then you might think that uh, uh, you would also calculate another estimate of the dip by taking the distance between the ends of the line and uh, um, taking the uh, uh, the inverse tangent of the uh, um, of the difference in uh, the difference in depths uh, over the distance between them. Okay, so z max is equal to uh, v one times t i max. Okay, the uh, maximum intercept time divided by two co two times the cosine of the critical angle, and also divided by the cosine of the dip, and then the minimum. Um, uh, depth, 
you know, on the up, up dip side is V1 times Ti min, also divided by 2, divided by the cosine of the critical angle and the cosine of the dip. OK, so um, these are things uh, you'll try in lab. You'll interpret some data for, uh, um, for first arrivals. You'll get time distance plots. Uh, you'll note these uh, pieces of these times, the intercept times. You'll, you'll make the, uh, the slopes that you pick uh, hold to a constant intercept time. And uh, you'll measure the V1s and the apparent V2s and come up with uh, you know, essentially a, a structural interpretation this way. Okay, where you've got dip, you've got depths, you've got, and you've also got the two velocities, v1 and v2, above and below the uh, refractor. Okay, some considerations of survey design. Uh, there's the, um, the maximum offset. Okay, uh, you know, how far do you have to get from the source to see the, uh, uh, the second velocity, right? And really, the best way to do that is to take some some geologically reasonable hypotheses and uh, use a modeling program, um, which could be as simple as these uh, equations here, right? Uh, you know, calculating the uh, the crossover distance, for instance, um, and uh, uh, to get the uh, uh, crossover distance for the deepest refractor you want to find, and uh, it turns out that's usually somewhere between three and six times. The depth of the refractor that uh, you'd like to be able to uh, to see, okay. But of course, the uh, uh, there's the problem of of having to uh, see that refractor both ways, both shooting up dip and shooting down dip. So uh, you you've got to also have some sort of guess about the uh, the dip of the refractor. Um, also, um, you know what source do you need to use and. Uh, this now depends a lot on the maximum offset and then where you are and, and uh, what kind of instruments you have, what the local experience is. You might, if you're in a totally new area, you might, you might have to either do some experiments or consult some local experts to see what uh, kinds of sources will reach your maximum offset. If your maximum offset is uh, many kilometers, then you're going to need some pretty large sources, um, either um, uh, drilled in uh, drill holes uh, filled with uh, explosives, or uh, uh, you're going to need to uh, uh, rent some heavy machinery. Um, on the other hand, uh, sources that uh, are fairly poor in some areas, like uh, uh, weight drop mechanisms uh, in the Great Basin, can work famously well in other areas that uh, don't have the noise conditions or the same kinds of uh, absorption and scattering that. Uh, the Great Basin does, uh, and then you have to uh, reverse. Okay, um, so uh, the absolute minimum is uh, you uh, are probably going to want a test shot uh, to see how far you're going to be able to go, verify that your uh, your uh, uh, configuration is going to record data. Um, then you need a, a strong forward shot and you need a strong reversal, and then, like I said. Um, to really uh, nail down all the velocities and the velocity variation throughout the section, you need to get at least nine shots total. 